Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Great. Okay, so uh, it looks like just under 80% of you were able to finish lab one and submit it by Sunday. If you submitted, your grade uh, should be available on Dropbox, or if not now, very soon. Charles is uh, posting those right now or just finished posting those. As a reminder, our late penalty policy is 5% uh, per school day. So if a project is due on Friday, which this lab was, then you can submit it by Sunday night without any penalty. I'm sorry I didn't bring that up earlier. <laughs> I hope uh, none of you killed yourself to finish by Friday night. Um, but it also means you can submit, submit it today for only a 5% late penalty. And in fact, <clears throat> you can submit it anytime after uh, Sunday uh, and before April 28th for only a 30% penalty because that's the maximum late penalty. So, uh, it, and as always, if you have any, uh, if any of you uh, are still struggling with that, uh, let us know. Uh, so I'd like to start out by uh, quickly going over quiz one. I'll, I'll try to make this fast so I don't, uh, so I don't, I don't, uh, bore you. Uh, I, I think the, the when I checked the grades on that were were really good, uh, so I'll just run through it real quick. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to see quiz one there. Yeah, there it is. I can see it. Okay, so um, uh, question one. Is, so the, you know, as you remember, the quiz quiz one was due uh, last uh, last Wednesday. Um, this was on um, uh, UART and SPI. Uh, so a bus protocol requires three wires named D in, D out, and clock. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? So the idea here is that um, some of the wire names differ with the different uh, different vendors. Um, but one of them is CLK, which is, uh, you know, I, I guess there's there's uh, there's no guarantee that's clock, but most likely that's clock. So that's uh, likely synchronous based on the, syn the signal names because clock is in there. Uh, second question, chip uh, transmits eight bits to its peer. How many bits does it receive in return? Um, eight bits. Um, oh, sorry, not possible to determine given the information given, right? Because if it's SPI, um, if it's SPI, then then you would get eight bits back. Um, always, you always get eight bits back if you send eight bits. But with UART, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and then a UART channel runs at 57,600 baud with 16 data bits, one start bit, one stop bit, and one parity bits. What's the data throughput? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's the usable data um, that you get, which is going to be 16 bits out of uh, 16 plus one plus one plus one. So 16 divided by 19. So it would be 57,600 times 16 divided by 19, because there's 19 total bits and only 16 are for data. Uh, then, then we have a timing diagram, the value received. This is least significant bit first. Um, this is obviously, it's not stated here, but this is obviously UART because of the names of the signals transmit and receive. Um, ground is not shown though, although so technically the, the protocol is three wires. Uh, but basically, uh, so we're looking for, uh, there's a start bit, uh, so we don't count that. And there are two stop bits, no parity. So probably the best way to, to read this is probably from the right to the left. Um, except you have to be careful because there's only seven data bits. So the first three will be grouped. Uh, oh no, sorry, uh, least significant. No, sorry, the first four will be because we're going least significant Oh, least significant on the left side, right, most significant on the right, right hand side. Yeah, so I was right the first time. Yeah, you're going to have one digit with three bits, and the second digit will have four bits. So we have to skip the first two stop bits, and we have to figure out which one of these ones we want to use. Uh, so the, the question is, what value is received? So we're going to use the Rx. So we'll start from the right, skip the first two. So we have 0, 0, 0. So the first hex digit is 0, and, of course, there's only one of those. So it's got to be A. I don't even need to look at the rest. Uh, but then the rest of the bits are 1, 1, 0, 1 which is D. Okay, what bit is missing uh, from the diagram? Obviously, I'm talking about transmit in this case because it's the only one with a missing bit. This has odd parity. Um, there's one stop bit, so you don't include the stop bit, um, but you include um, 
everything else except for the start bit. Uh, in this case, it's odd parity, so we've got one uh, one bit in there, not including the stop bit or the start bit, right? So not including the the, the first or last. Um, so it must be zero because if the if that missing bit was a was a one, then there would be an even number of one bits, which would violate the odd parity. So again, when you're looking at this question, don't don't look at the last bit or the first bit. Um, because in the case one last what the last bit because there's one stop bit right if there could be two stop bits in which case you would disregard the last two bits but in this case there's one stop bit there's always one start bit uh so you don't count those and you just count one bits so that would be a zero um uh, let's see uh when does the data signal change so c pool is one c is zero so this one's pretty tricky um CIFA is the phase, though, of the data, so it's going to be prior to the first clock edge. So it's got to have to. It's going to be A or C, right, uh, right off the bat, because when CIFA is zero, you, you, the data gets a head start on the clock. So the answer has to be A or C. Um, and the difference between those is 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 the clock uh, is the first edge of the clock rising or falling. Well, if C pull is one. That means the clock would have been high, and so the first, you know, before the the, the exchange. So uh, the first edge must be falling, so the answer must be C. So prior to the first clock edge, which is falling, and that's and, and again the falling part is based on the C pull, C C pull, and the prior to the first clock edge is based on the C fa. So there's basically you know those two bits represent the, the two pieces of information in these answers. Uh, what percentage of an SPI uh, SPI cha channels master to slave bandwidth can be utilized when performing a series of single write transactions? Um, this is basically um, master to slave bandwidth, right? So master to slave, that means that the master sends the address and the data if it's doing a write. Uh, so that would be 100%. Um, unfortunately, none of the data coming back from the slave to the master would be used in this case. Uh, in a daisy chain SPI connection between a master and slaves, how many clock cycles are, re are required to complete a full exchange? Uh, so this would be n times 8. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about this in a minute because this is this is a little this is actually a little bit more complicated than I've kind of let on. Uh, what is C pull and C fa for the exchange below? Uh, well, that, the C pull is easy. You just look at what clock starts out as it's one, um, and C fa you just look at when the data changes relative to the clock. In this case, you see that the data uh, data obviously, which is MOSI and MISO, uh, they're changing at the same time the clock does. So C fa must also be one. So it should be one one C. Um, Okay, uh, number seven, 100% was wrong. It was 50%. Um, single right. Okay, okay, well, I'll fix that then. That's no problem. Not sure why that got that. That was probably a typo in the uh, source code. So, yeah, I'm glad I went over that. Yeah, no problem. I'll change that and I'll give, I'll give you credit um, for that if you got it wrong. Um, yeah, if you're doing rights, it should be 100%. Master to slave bandwidth. Now, if I had said slave to master, then the answer would have been zero, right? Or if I had said read, then it would have been 50% because, um, oh, I'll, uh, typically if I have I make a mistake like that, I'll just give everyone credit for number seven um, because you might have been confused. Although, you know, the way it's set up is you, you shouldn't have known it was wrong um, until the, the, the test closed. But I, I usually just give everyone credit when I screw something up like that. Um, these quizzes are prone, very error prone. I haven't found a better way to <laughs> to do this. Um, even when I have both TAs um, check it over, usually there's still bugs that slip through, even with all three of us looking at it. So, um, but yeah, I'll fix that. It's no problem. Uh, Okay, so that's number, let's see, we got through uh, nine and then 10. What data is written in the transaction below? Um, okay, well, it's written... So, you know, we only have to look at the the last eight bits because the first eight bits is the address and flags. Um, and so this is most significant bit first. So we should be looking from, we should be reading from, uh, in this case, left to right. So uh, let's see. So we got to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it's rising edge. Changes to we want to look at the data on the rising edge. So that should be one, 
one one zero. So the first hex digit should be one 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 zero, which is E, right? So there's only one answer that starts with E, so that's got to be it. And then five is zero one zero one. So that's the answer for that. Okay, so that's the quiz. Um, um, I already posted quiz two, which will cover I squared C and uh, some stuff about the multi-master stuff. Uh, and that should go live at 4:45. So I, I added, I tried to time it so you can do it after the end of the lecture. And also, I'll end this lecture 20 minutes early uh, at 4:50. So it'll give you some time to work on that. Um, I, I actually have 20 questions on that quiz, though. It's twice as long. For some reason, I, when I wrote it, I thought I had 20 on this one, but I see now I had 10. So um, the, the second quiz will be a little, will be longer, 20 questions, uh, and it will be due. Uh, in a week, um, which will be uh, Monday before lecture. So I have it closing at 3.55 next Monday, um, just so you can have it done before we have lecture. Uh, the same rules apply to attempts, and then the second, the second attempt is, is what your grade will be, and then you should see the grade um, after the quiz closes. Um, okay. Um, all right, so we have a few few things to tie up on interfacing. Let me switch my share here. Let's see. Stop sharing that and reshare PowerPoint. There we go. It should pop up here soon. Okay, hopefully you can... Oh, there it is. Got it. Okay. All right, um, so... So last time I started talking about um, the multi-slave uh, SPI, and we had a question on the quiz about that. So um, you know you have these two options, and you can have these basically one slave select per slave, and, or you can have uh, one slave select in total, and you can daisy chain uh, the bits going through the slave. Um, th this option looks a little bit more attractive because you don't have to worry about the potential for double driving, you know, the MISO line, uh, and it uses less pins. So this daisy chain looks pretty good, I think. But the problem is you have to be careful with this because remember that I mentioned that in SPI, the transaction level protocol is defined by the vendors. And so you have to make sure that if you were to use a daisy chain approach, it would, it would be really important that all the slaves are basically would have to be from the same vendor. They'd all have to agree on what the transaction protocol is. Otherwise, it would be a disaster. And also, you know, keep in mind that like with this daisy chain approach, you wouldn't be able to do something like read a value from all the slaves in one transaction. That wouldn't be possible because each slave has to decide on whether it's going to, like when it's shifting data out, it would have to decide on whether it's going to shift its data out that, you know, that the master might want to read, or if it's going to be forwarding data from the previous slave. You can't do both. You'd have to decide one or the other because it's a shift register. So if I'm shifting data out, I got to make that decision. So obviously you can only, you can only read uh, one value at a time if you're doing a read. Uh, from one of the slaves per transaction, then of course it takes more more shifts to actually get the data through. So the daisy chain is, um, you know, it's kind of tricky. It, it really depends on uh, the slaves all, you know, participating and, and cooperating together. So you wouldn't be able to do that unless the, the slaves were, you know, they would have to all be all from the same vendor and they'd all have to be the same protocol. Whereas with the independent approach, you know, you, you could mix slaves together as long as they had a tri-stated MISO line, which I think most devices on SPI do, but I, that's, my, that's my suspicion, although I, I, admittedly I don't have enough experience with SPI to, 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 to tell you for sure. But I, I would think it'd be reasonable to, to assume that. So just to, to elaborate on that a minute, uh, the push-pull is the, the idea that you know, when you drive an output pin, you're either pulling it up to GC, uh, G, DV, uh, um, VDD, or to ground, and so you have to be careful. You don't want to have one device try to pull one the, the wire up to VDD and the other one try to pull it down to ground at the same time because then you get a short circuit and it results in the actual voltage being 
in the undefined region. Uh, you can add these tri-states to avoid that, but you know the, the, the presence or absence of these tri-states is going to depend on the device. So um, again, you'd have to read the data sheet and, and, and check that. Okay, and then we talked about the open drain. Um, basically, the open drain is designed to avoid any, any kind of um, problems from double driving a wire. That's the idea, anyway. Um, the, the problem with it is that um, it, it's hard to tell if you're double driving it if you have both, if you have multiple hosts set, it's trying to set it to one. Right. So because because it's, you know, it's one by default. And if you have multiple devices trying to drive the wire to one, then it's there's really no way to tell. And this is partly I think this is why at least I suspect this is why I squared C does the start bit the way it does. So the start not start bit, sorry, start signal. So the start signal relies on pooling down in, in a sequence, you know, SDA first and then S, SCL second. So I think, and I, I don't know this for sure, but my suspicion is this is the mechanism by which uh, you can detect collisions when two devices try to send something at the same time or, or try to initiate a transaction at the same time, because you can, um, you, you can have, you can pull down your SDA and then you can check to see if someone else pulls down S, SCL. Now, you know, the timing there is a little dicey, um, but that, I think that's kind of the idea is that you're looking for, so basically the, the hosts are using those SDA and STL as an input and an output, which obviously they have to, they have to in order to be I squared C, but they also use them as inputs. They read them during the start signal phase of the transaction, which allows them to detect um, a collision. So uh, that's basically how open drain works. Um, Let's see, is there anything else to really say about that? Not, not too much. Um, the problem, though, you know, the, the disadvantage of open drain is that when you are pulling down, um, you're pulling current down through this pull-up resistor. So uh, open drain is less efficient when it comes to uh, it uses more power. There's more leakage when you're when you're pulling down. Um, and then, you know, if you have more than one pulling down at the same time, obviously you'd have less equivalent resistance to ground, so you'd pull even more current. Um, but it's still, it's not a huge deal. And, you know, so it's pretty common to use these open drain style interfaces. Uh, so let's see, uh, what else? I squared C, uh, so it's multi-master. It has a, uh, a bit ordering that's consistent. It goes most significant, the least significant, which, you know, for any of you guys that have been reading those timing diagrams, that's, that's kind of a godsend that you can read you know, you can actually read the signals from left to right. You don't have to worry about trying to write, read them from right to left, as I had to do with that quiz. Um, I mentioned the, uh, so the start, there's a start signal and a stop signal. And the way I remember this, and I, I don't know if this is the, you know, the original idea, but the way I remember it is that uh, generally during a transaction, you never change SDA, which is the data line. You never change that when the clock is high unless you're doing a start or stop. So, um, so that's kind of, that's a special signal. Uh, but normally when you're sending bits, you'll notice that um, the clock goes high and goes low inside of each bit, each bit time. So, you know, each bit has kind of a slot and the clock is actually doing a, uh, a full duty cycle within that slot. So the rising edge of the clock is after the transition of the data and the falling edge of the clock is before the next transition of the data. So you get this basically this level sensitive behavior, um, which is, uh, um, you know, different. We're not looking for edges as in you with, you know, SPI and UART, you're looking for um, kind of like when the, during the peaks of the clock, which actually, makes it easier to read the timing diagrams. The one thing you have to be careful of though is that keep in mind that there's that acknowledge bit. So each byte that's sent across isn't actually a byte. It's actually going to be nine bits. There's uh, going to be, you know, eight bits and then the acknowledgement. And the acknowledgement is something that is, it's kind of strange. You have this kind of a change of hands where um, the, 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 the master sends the, uh, the flag read write flag the address bits and then the read write flag sorry the address bits come first and the read write flag and then it and then it surrenders that sda line for the slave to acknowledge and then if uh, if it does if it's doing a write then it then it 
takes takes up control of it again, or if it's a read, uh, it it keeps surrendering control for this the slave then to send the data back. Um, and then the acknowledgement there after the data is always a, a change in control. It's it goes to the slave if it's a write. It goes to the master if it's a read. So you could, in theory, uh, have the address part uh, knacked. And, like in other words, you, th there could be an error during the address part, and then, or there could not be an error during the address part, and there could be an error during the data part, right? So you could kind of have a half fail transaction, sort of, because there's acts for both halves. Um, I think the most common, you know, reason why the acknowledgement wouldn't go low is if the slave just isn't listening for whatever reason or is dis disconnected. But you know, the slave could, you know, even if the slave is listening, um, it could, you know. Put the acknowledgement high. Likewise, the master, when it receives data from the slave, it could put the acknowledgement high during that bit slot, um, and um, you know, uh, signal a uh, knack. I also knack meaning not not acknowledged. Um, and also the the um, clock. I want to mention that the clock is always driven by the master, um, never by the slave. So. Um, Oh yeah, and that's a good point. Charles mentioned that you know the the uh, the other the other uh, end of the 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 the, the intended uh, recipient of the transaction might be busy, um, you know, depending on whether you know s some chips have dedicated hardware trans hardware for the I squared C, and other ones have to do bit banging, meaning that the, the processor would have to be involved. So um, uh, so yeah, uh, one thing I forgot to mention last time. Is that read write flag? I I I I might have mentioned it, but I didn't emphasize it as much as I should. So the read write flag is in I squared C. It's always in the same spot. It's the last bit uh, before the acknowledge acknowledge in the first byte. Um, it it is always in the same spot. Now that's not necessarily true with SPI. SPI uses you know that it relies on application defined protocols for transactions. So the read-write bit could be anywhere with an SPI transaction, depending on the vendor. Whereas with I squared C, it should be in that same spot all the time. And also, its polarity should be consistent as well, meaning that a zero is a write and a one is a read. In the case of SPI, you know that, that could be reversed. It could be that a one is a write and a zero is a read. And again, it depends on the the data sheet that you're reading for the device you're trying to communicate with. But in the case of I squared C. Uh, it should be consistent. That that should be standardized. So the read write comes after. It's a flag. It comes after the address bit. So there's seven address bits. The read write flag, and then the acknowledgement that is that comes from the slave. Um, um, there is a variant of I squared C that has a 10-bit address, uh, but in this course we'll just we're just going to look at the the simpler form, you know, um, of, of the the transaction with the seven-bit address. One one flag and one acknowledgement in the first the first part and then the second part is the data. Uh, so yeah, the the so if there's a knack, um, generally in the case of the the Atmel M28Ps, then if there's a knack, it's a flag. It's presented as a flag to the uh, to the user. Um, so the user the the software would have to decide if it's going to resend or not. Uh, so it would be up to wh whatever code you're writing as as a user of the I squared C. Um, there's uh, if I I don't remember any way to tell the hardware on the Atmel chip to automatically resend without the you know software telling it to. I think that's uh, um, that's something that's up to the user. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this timing diagram. Um, you notice that I I kind of did the thing here where I I put a half cycle um, in between the data changing and the clock changing. <laughs> um, so you'll notice here that the data, the data changes on this dotted line here in the middle of of these two bits. And so that's how I tried. To, I made it so you can kind of clearly see where where the bits are being transmitted. Um, that's not, you know, sometimes you'll see it like this where the clock looks more like a, a sawtooth pattern. But in this case, I made it look more like a regular clock. I just kind of dragged the uh, the bits out to be essentially each bit is two clock cycles or two two clock cycles. Um, no, like a, 
one, two. No, actually, that's not true. The clock is, it's one clock cycle, but the clock is phase shifted. So it's in the middle of the data, the data slot. Um, so you get both edges inside the bit. Um, oh, that's two should be, <laughs> two should be super scripted. Okay. Um, so notice also I say most significant bit first. This is a, I think this is this is a bug in in my code. I, it, it, the most significant bit should always be first, uh, which that shouldn't be something that you uh, can vary with an I squared C. Okay, um, yeah, the stop condition is the right. So the stop is kind of the reverse of the start. So the start is when we change SDA when clock is still high, which is what it normally is. But when we stop, it's when we bring the clock up, um, and then we bring the data up. So in both cases, you're changing the data when the clock is high, which is which has a special meaning. But you know, it's not really, you know, like I said, it's not like UART where you have a, a start and a stop bit that that occupy a bit slot. This is more of a signal that happens. Uh, okay, change that. I keep getting things are bugging me. Superscript those. Okay, uh, okay. So that's that's it. That's basically um, SPI and uh, I squared C. You'll notice that a lot of these protocols are very similar to those. A lot of th th there have been a lot of protocols that are kind of derivatives of, of SPI and I squared C. In fact, JTAG, which is the next one we're going to talk about, is a derivative of SPI in the sense that it is a shift register-based protocol, um, and it has a lot of signals. It has four signals like SPI. So JTAG is similar to SPI. Um, it has a um, and, and JTAG, by the way, is is um, uh, used for it's intended for testing and debugging. So, JTAG shows up. Uh, it, it's a way for you. It was originally developed as a way to test chips after they were after they were well ch chips and circuit boards, uh, because it gives you a way to. Uh, it's it's basically a side channel into a chip that allows you to test connections and data paths within both the chip and the circuit board after you you fabricate them. So there's it's usually an automated process that goes through where. Uh, the chips are tested with JTAG, and then, of course, if they fail the JTAG test, they're they're thrown away. Um, it's kind of like one of the last steps of manufacturing semiconductors. Uh, but uh, JTAG is also used kind of at the user level uh, for uh, d debugging systems. They're used a lot with uh, FPGAs for um, testing FPGA designs. Those are programmable logic chips. Uh, they're also used for programming FPGAs. And um, uh, they're used uh, for debugging uh, embedded microcontrollers. So uh, JTAG is comprised of, generally it's four wires. So there's a data in and a data out that's very similar to MOSI and MISO. Um, JTAG is generally set up the way the daisy-chained SPI is set up, where you have multiple devices that are part of a JTAG chain. Uh, and then you kind of daisy chain them together. So you have a testing apparatus, kind of a top level interface, and you send bits in with TDI, and those bits are, are passed down along multiple chips, usually on, on a circuit board, and then, they, and then pits, the bits come back out from TDO and they come back to the test apparatus. And it is a, a synchronous protocol, it has a clock, it has a TCK, I hate that, <laughs> it should be, TCLK, but test T clock, TCK. It's not obvious to me that that's clock when you look at it, but that's the clock. And then there's a TMS, um, test mode select. Now this one's pretty cool. This is the TMS is what makes JTAG different from SPI. And then there's a test reset that's optional. Uh, in my experience, that's rarely used. And then they have a version of JTAG that has a reduced pin count. It can work on two pins, but uh, in my experience, that one is also fairly rarely used. The most popular variant is the four-pin version of JTAG, and so this is a design. This is a block diagram that kind of shows you how the devices are arranged. This is the same way we did with daisy-chained SPI. So each pin has a TDI and a TDO pin, and then the TDO pin, you know, connects to the TDI pin of the next device down, and so on. Uh, and then whoever's kind of on the top end here, who's who's generating the first input to the, TD, the, the TDI to the, the first chip and receiving the TDO from the last chip is going to be generally as a USB bridge and this the USB would be connected to a workstation so the, the, generally the way you use this is through a, um, a dongle you know USB dongle that you know you have one side as USB you plug that into a workstation and then the other side is a connector that connects to 
um, JTAG. The TMS and the T-Clock, much like Daisy Chain SPI, are also fanned out. So the T-Clock is fanned out to all the chips. They all share one clock. And then the TMS. But the TMS is not like the Slave Select um, on a... Um, uh, well, it is in the sense that it's fanned out all the chips, but it works differently. So the JTAG, every JTAG chip that's in the chain, as well as the the master that's driving the whole thing, um, has a state machine uh, that has 16 states. Uh, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, 14. Two, yeah, 16 states. <laughs> um, and in order for JTAG to work properly. Every, every uh, device on the chain has to be in the same state. So they all have to agree on what state they're in. Um, and so um, now in order to guarantee that, the, there's this cool feature where if you set TMS to 1 and pulse the clock five times, it guarantees that that, that sequence will get everyone back to the test logic reset state, which is kind of the, the starting state. That's the one in the upper left-hand corner here. So hopefully you guys are familiar with state machines. I I'm going to go into more detail on state machines later in the semester where we'll be building some with uh, system Verilog. Um, but just to give you a quick rundown, if, if you haven't seen these in 2.12 or, or 2.11, uh, the state machine is represents, you know, every every device can be in one state at a time, and then you can change states uh, when you see a clock edge, um, and during that clock edge, you can go to a different state depending on the symbol on the state. Well, this state machine is actually very simple because all of the state transitions are controlled by TMS. So that way, every one of these states has just two outgoing transitions, one for TMS of zero and one for TMS of one. So basically, you, by, by, the master toggles TMS, and then it, by doing that and toggling the clock, because the master is controlling that as well, um, it can basically dictate what state it can put all the devices on the JTAG chain in, which is I think is pretty neat. Now there's a state here called shift data register and shift instruction register. So the way that the way that JTAG works is unlike SPI that basically sends the address and the flags in the first byte and then it does the data in the second byte, you know, inside the um, you know, inside the transaction, you know, it does two exchanges. JTAG works by using the TMS to get everybody into the shift IR state, which, you know, is stands for instruction register, which is actually misleading because it's not an instruction, but in fact, it's an address. So once you get everyone into the shift IR state, then um, you, you, you set TMS low because you see this loop back transition. So as long as you get to the shift IR state, you're going to stay there as long as TMS is low, even if you're getting clock edges. And then you use the TDI pin to shift data into through the chain, which will allow you to shift a um, basically that the, the 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 data with T if you're in the shift IR state and you're shifting data in with TMI or sorry TDI right. Yeah, TDI. Um, the TDI uh, will go through the instruction registers of all the things on the chain. So, in order to do this right, you have to pulse the clock um, a number of times, equaling the number of devices, or actually, well, the total the total width of all the instruction registers together of all the devices on the chain. So, you know, if you have three devices and they only have a five bit instruction register, then you have to do 15 cycles uh, once you get in the shift IR, and then that becomes the instruction, which in fact is really just an address. And then you use the TMS and the clock again to get out of that state and go to the shift DR state for all the devices, at which point you do another 15 or however many clock cycles you need to shift the data registers. So this, this ends up just being a giant shift register where um, all of the data registers will shift down, and then, the, of course, the master can also shift things into the data registers if, ne if necessary. So, um, so this allows you to do, you know, a giant shift register uh, thing. Um, uh, so that's basically the way it works. Um, every JTAG device has its own kind of map of, of, of addresses to special... Um, uh, values. Uh, there are a few that are kind of universal, though. One of them is like device ID. So, you know, you can do a, an initial 
what they call a boundary scan, which is where you go through this process and it'll give you all the devices on the chain. So like if you go inside of an FPGA tool that does the JTAG chain, it'll actually, you just hit scan, it'll show you all the devices on there. Um, it'll have a little little picture usually and it shows you the little little device map of everything on the chain. And then usually you can right click on one and, and um, you know, program it or, you know, connect to it or launch the debugger or whatever you need to do. So that's how JTAG works. It's, I think it's, I think it's a neat little protocol. It's obviously very inefficient in the sense that it takes a lot of cycles to do, to do stuff. Um, but it's designed to be kind of foolproof, uh, because, you know, essentially it's, it's supposed to be like a backdoor into the chip. It's not designed for performance. It's designed for reliability. So it generally runs about one megabit per second, uh, kind of like the other protocols we've talked about. Um, and then um, I just want to briefly mention there's because uh, you'll I'm sure you'll see references to this if, uh, in um, you know if you if you read about uh, embedded systems or cyber physical systems there's a very popular protocol called CAN called controller area network and this was originally developed for automotive applications and it's used in uh, I I think my understanding is that it's it's used it's used quite a bit in cars. I know um, I was part of a project a few years ago. Uh, well, it's been more than a few now. Um, but I, I worked on this project where we had this uh, really cool um, hydrogen fuel cell bus that we had uh, on loan. We, we, we tested it in uh, the, the campus bus network and then also with the um, the city buses, the Central Midlands RTA. Uh, and that, that thing was, was cool. It had hydrogen fuel cells in it, and it had uh, batteries, and it had all these really crazy 480-volt um, converters, uh, DC to DC converters. But um, all of the battery charging and, and all the control was all managed through CAN. So, like, the idea was you'd plug in, you know, you could plug in a, a monitor, and you, could, you, can, you can open up communication with any system on the bus through this CAN network. And CAN is actually based on uh, I squared C. So it's essentially the same thing. There's a few minor differences, but for all practical purposes, it's I squared C. Uh, and then there's I squared S, which is for digital audio. And oh, CAN, by the way, is kind of an alternative to, o o um, th there were some older protocols, um, ODB2, you know, that are, but CAN is kind of the modern one. I think it's kind of the state of the art. And then, and then uh, I squared C is for audio. And it it is uh, very similar to I squared, uh, sorry I squared S is for audio, and it's very similar to I squared C. The only difference it is a third pin that is used for uh, word select that allows you to switch between left and right um, audio channels. Um, but I had a um, a capstone group a few years ago that uh, used I squared S to do a project where they were doing an audio related project for me. So I thought it was kind of neat. So you'll see that. But again, it's both of these guys are derived from I squared C. So kind of give you the uh, final comparison here to tie everything up. Um, we have um, uh, I squared uh, C, SPI, and JTAG are the ones we talked about in depth. Uh, and UART, actually, I don't have UART in this table. but. Um, they can be, some of them are half, the I squared C um, are half duplex. JTAG, uh, actually, wait a minute, that's wrong, isn't it? JTAG is like SPI. It should really be, I mean, it's, it's well, it's, it's uh, I guess it depends on, if you're doing a full shift through, I guess, in that sense, everyone's talking at the same time, so it's full duplex. But duplex defines whether you can do bidirectional communication at the same time. Uh, with a performance with I squared C, is there are there are speed uh, settings for I squared C that are supposed to be standardized. So, uh, you know, as you might have noticed, I squared C is is a little bit more locked down than SPI is, in the sense that SPI is is really doesn't there's not there's very few details involved. Like you know, you can do almost anything you want with I squared uh, SPI, whereas I squared C is more standardized. So with I squared C, they standardize the bit rates, and the fastest one I've ever seen was 3.4 megabits per second. Whereas with SPI and JTAG, it just depends on how fast the master drives the clock. So the master determines the, the performance. Obviously, if you try to go too fast, then you'll run into signal integrity issues. And you'll end up with, uh, you'll get bit errors. Um, generally, though, that those, you know, those, those are generally operated in the megabits, single digit megabits per second. Um, SPI, JTAG use the push-pull. I squared C is the open drain. Um, S I squared C is 8-bit. Um, um, 
There's no restriction on word size for SPI and JTAG. Addressing is fixed with I squared C. So generally speaking, when you buy a peripheral, it has a kind of a built-in I squared C address, whereas the addressing with SPI and JTAG are more just up to the vendors. And then of course, I squared C is two pins and the other two are four pins. And I squared C is the only one that supports acknowledgement. So um, I think that these are a good uh, sampling of chip-to-chip -chip style protocols um, that you'll see with these low, low performance systems. Now I mentioned earlier, I mentioned you know, PCI and Thunderbolt and things like that that are higher performance, the kind of higher end chip-to-chip -chip style protocols. And it's kind of amazing, you know, PC, PCI Express, um, you know, we've actually had in the lab some kind of lightweight boards that actually support that. Like the Intel, um, Intel had a board called the Galileo um, that was kind of a Arduino style and actually had SPI, um, and, uh, sorry, uh, PCI rather, PCI Express. Um, I think it was just a Gen 1, so it wasn't a super high speed, but it was kind of impressive that some of the smaller ones have PCI, but uh, generally speaking, if you're in the controllers, you know, you're, you're going to be using uh, something like one of these. Okay, well, that's good. That, that, that uh, finishes up the uh, interfacing uh, lecture. And so um, that actually, uh, what we've covered so far is um, everything we covered last spring in this class. So congratulations, you've already finished all the content from last spring. <laughs> Although in that case, uh, you know, it was not a fair comparison because we were also giving out a lot of um, specific information about the chips that we're using in, in class too. But in terms of the actual conceptual stuff, this is everything we got, got done last spring. So we're now in um, uncharted territory. Um, so the next topic is radically different. Uh, than the lecture on interfacing. Uh, the lecture on interfacing was very much applied um, and um, uh, referred to, you know, kind of technical stuff that, that you know, that, that that's uh, applied. Uh, the next lecture is more conceptual and it's on uh, control theory. Let me just switch over here. To, yeah, next set of slides. Okay. So here we are with control theory. So um, control theory, so in this lecture, I, I'm, I, my intention is to give you a taste of control theory. Um, since there's a whole course on the topic, uh, electrical 331, e ELCT 331. And as a computer engineer, you have the option to take that course and get an elective credit for it. It'll count towards your, your computer engineering degree. Uh, control theory is um, is a huge field, um, and so I've chosen. In, in generally speaking, it's it's kind of uh, considered to be an electrical engineering topic, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Charles said he wished he had taken it. Yeah. So. Um, so why am I talking about it? Why is this relevant to us? Uh, you might be asking, you might be thinking. Um, it's, it's hugely important relating to cyber physical systems because as I mentioned in the first lecture, cyber physical systems are all about designing embedded processors that control physical things. So this is uh, robots, you know, in, in, in gen generally, um, Oh, no, no, uh, no, it's for, actually, um, Electrical Engineering 331 is required for EE students, but it is optional for computer engineering students. So um, it's, it's like I said, it's generally going to be, oh, this course, yeah, this course is just for CE, that's correct, yeah. So, um, so why am I covering it? Because if you're doing, if you're working with cyber physical systems, you're going to have to understand control theory, at least a little bit about control theory. Um, so generally, this was, you know, usually focused on uh, power electronics and robotics. But nowadays, you know, we're, we're controlling. Um, well, it's generally the same things, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more work now in autonomous systems and vehicles and and uh, in, in power electronics for electric vehicles and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and also, you know, drones and, and that sort of stuff. So um, I want to just, I want to cover a little bit of this to give you a taste of it. And if, you, if you're interested in this, then you can, you can always take Electrical Engineering 331, where hopefully they'll, they'll give you a nice, uh, a, a nice treatment. Uh, so um, let's see. Um, Oh, also, I want to mention too that um, 
when you do control theory design or control control system design, it, it, you know, much like any kind of design that you do for uh, electronic design automation, you know, chip design or FPGA design, um, it relies a lot on tools. You know, you design something in a CAD tool, you you evaluate it with a simulation tool, a CAD tool. Uh, in control systems, you generally are using MATLAB is the most common, as far as I know, most common tool for doing control system design. MATLAB really has 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 kind of risen as the as the premier tool for that. I'm sure there's open source tools as well. Uh, you could also do a lot of this, you know, just by um, you know writing your own code. But but the most powerful tool for this is MATLAB. Um, I've chosen though to avoid giving you any projects. So all of the stuff we cover is going to be stuff that you can work out uh, by hand, essentially. I'm just going to cover the concepts. Uh, and the reason is because um, we, we're finding that assigning projects over the virtual format is, is pretty pretty tough without being able to meet in the lab and show you how to do things. So um, we're just going to give you, you know, this will just be purely conceptual. You won't have to use any tools. We won't have any projects for this. It'll just be problems um, that you have to solve. Um, Maybe you know next time we teach it, we'll we'll introduce that. But I don't think this is the right time to do that now. Uh, but once you learn this stuff, you should be able to pick up the tools and start using them. Um, okay, so uh, so I have I have uh, some topics here that I've chosen uh, for this. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about um, open and closed loop control. Then I'm going to talk about uh, linear time invariant systems, which is uh, one way you model both the controllees and the controllers. Um, oh, these aren't the lecture slides I uploaded? Okay, I'll double check that, sorry. I thought I, uh, I might have uploaded the wrong file. Hopefully it wasn't anything embarrassing. <laughs> I'll double check that, thank you. Um, um, so uh, let's see, so yeah, t linear time invariant systems um, is something actually that you guys already know. Um, because you already use these in Electrical Engineering 222, which is the Signal and Systems course, and in um, probably you use them in Math 241, at least to some degree, and differential equations. Um, and so L LTE systems are just basically a way to use, uh, a way to apply uh, partial differential equations uh, and, and use them in the frequency domain. Uh, and they're used to model the, the dynamics of both the system and the controller. Um, in fact, it's it's been um, it's actually been like 25 years since I took either of those courses, and and uh, this is also the first time I'm covering this material. So many of you may actually be more comfortable with these uh, t linear time invariant systems than I am. Um, but after that, I'll talk about stability, um, which is essentially the objective of any control system is to make an unstable system stable. Then I'll move on. I'll talk about eigenfunctions and transfer functions. Uh, which are uh, a way to uh, compose and analyze these LTI systems. Then I'll cover um, uh, open and closed loop transfer functions and then get into some examples of how to build controllers and tune them. So there's a lot of little topics here uh, that will jump from one to the other. Uh, and I'll try to, I'll take this slow. If you have any, you know, if you have any questions, um, obviously just feel free to stop and ask. Okay, so um, I mentioned at the beginning of this beginning of the semester that uh, we're, we're concerned in this class with controllers and cyber physical systems. Um, controllers are used uh, when you're controlling a physical system, like for example, it, like the hoverboard there I'm showing on the left, which is um, you know it, it has the actuator in it that actively uh, keeps the person on it upright, which is um, Pretty pretty neat. My I, my I bought my daughter one of these for Christmas, and it's kind of funny because she's really good at it uh, until it powers off, and then it just spills her instantly <laughs> on the floor. Um, so yeah, they're they're kind of neat. And then if you look under the uh, electric vehicles, uh, use these power electronic systems, which are anytime you do a DC to DC converter or an AC to DC or DC to AC or an AC to AC, uh, you use these re re relies on controllers. Because um, when you have a DC to DC converter, which is something you need, like for example, to to, to have a battery power a um, a vehicle, um, you you basically have to you have to the controller has to keep the converter stable 
as the load on the other side of it changes. So, you know, every time you hit the accelerator, like if you're driving a Tesla, the controller has to be able to um, precisely control the DC to DC converter. And when I was um, uh, on that fuel cell bus project, that was the biggest issue we had technologically was the DC to DC converters. It wasn't the fuel cell, <laughs> the hydrogen fuel cell system. That was actually working pretty well. And it wasn't the batteries. Um, it was the, the converters that they, they had the trouble with. And part of the problem there is that was especially complex because that was not only high voltage, but it was also the voltage that you got from the DC voltage you get from hydrogen fuel cells is very noisy. And the voltage you put into the batteries when you're charging them has to be very clean or you risk damaging the batteries. So that, that was a very uh, tough one. And that, that ultimately that bus failed uh, because the, the technology didn't exist at the time to do the DC-DC converter right. And like I said, ultimately what that boils down to is, I mean, yeah, there's some electronic passive components in there and stuff, but a large part of that is the control, the controller um, uh, logic, which is, you know, is controlled by a processor. And then, of course, you know, you've got drones um, that have to be controlled and, and things like the 3D printer that I show there, you know, the print head has to be controlled and robots. And then also I mentioned in the first lecture that, of course, self-driving uh, cars and driver systems, cameras, thermostat, drone, those are all control systems. So um, there are three kinds of controllers, technically. Um, um, there are passive controllers, which is the kind you see, like if you see like a, a tractor trailer like these ones, and you see these crazy uh, features they put on them, these these, I don't know what they're called. They're like these shapes that stick out of trucks. Um, this is kind of a, this is a form of passive control because your, your goal is to control the, the drag of the truck. And you can do that passively by adding these, these features, um, which, you know, passively control the air resistance. You're not doing any computation, right? The second type of controller is an open loop controller. Um, so as an example of this, imagine like a, a toaster controller, um, which has an input uh, from the from the user. Um, you think of it like a set point, which is the the level of toast brownness, and then there's an output of the controller, which is a temperature setting and duration for the toaster, and that's injected into the toaster itself. And then the whole system output is the actual toast color. Uh, if you want the toast brown and um, it, or for example, you say you want the toast brown and the, and the controller will instruct the toaster to toast with a specific temperature. And this is all based on an understanding of the dynamics of the toaster ahead of time. Um, but the problem is, is that an open loop controller can't deal with uncertainties or disturbances in the system. So if the toast were to somehow catch on fire, the controller, an open, an open loop controller would you know, happily continue to instruct the toaster to continue toasting. Um, until the, the allotted time is up because there's no feedback signal for the controller to know that, you know, that, that, it's, that it's way browner <laughs> than it should be. Um, and so a closed loop system is when you take the output of the device you're controlling and you, you feed it back, um, not directly to the controller itself, but you feed it back and you subtract it from the set point or the input. So basically you have the input to the whole system is I want... Uh, brown toast and you have kind of a brownness that comes out. Yes, yeah, PID control. Yeah, th so PID controllers are the most common type of this feedback uh, controller. I know you guys use these in, um, in 274, so, so this should be um, a, a review in that sense. Um, so the, um, so yeah, so you've got this feedback. You, you basically have the the set point where you want the toast subtracted from the actual toast color, and that gives you an error value, which is fed into the controller, which then calculates an input from the actual toaster. Um, and so that way, this type of a closed loop control can deal with uncertainties and um, 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 disturbances. And so, and a lot of these, by the way, come from not having a truly accurate uh, model of the device you're controlling. Uh, so, like, if you had a if you had a perfect model of the device you're controlling, then an open loop controller would be would be fine. But you don't always have a, a perfect con, um, you know model of of the of the of the device. And by the way, the van the device is usually called the plant inside of control theory. They always call that the plant. So the thing that you're controlling is the plant, 
and the thing you're controlling it with is the controller. So you don't have um, control over the dynamics necessarily of the plant, but you want to model those, um, you describe them, and then together uh, with that, you, you can then design a controller which will then control the plant and hopefully make the whole system stable. That's your goal. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, stop there um, because I want to give you 20 minutes to uh, to work on the quiz. Um, if you have any questions about that, if you find any typos or bugs, let me know. Uh, send me an email. Um, and um, if you don't have a grade for Project 1, let us know. Or if you have any questions about your grade on Project 1, let us know. And if you haven't submitted Project 1, it's not too late. You can still do that. Okay? All right. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and end it here, and I'll see you guys on, on Wednesday.